Thanks be to God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, I have a question to start with for the ladies. And I need you to, to be very honest about this. The first time you saw your husband or your boyfriend, the very first time you saw them, did you fall madly in love with them and want to spend the rest of your life with them? I see a lot of head shaking, no. <laughs> Most women say, no way, no way. I mean, you, look, you think back and you look and you thought, I don't want that guy. He's dressed like a peacock or he looks like a bum. He runs with the wrong crowd. He's got the wrong job. You know, he's too unsophisticated. There are a whole host of reasons you did not want that guy. And yet, you ended up with him. Why? Why did you end up with a man when your first thought was, no way, I don't want him. I would never be with him. I can tell you why. Because he pursued you. He saw you, he wanted you, and he pursued your heart. He wanted to knock you off your feet, catch you in his arms, and hold on to you forever. And because he pursued you with a passionate love, he captured you. If you can understand that, then you can understand the heart of God. That makes sense? Because by nature, when we first think about being in a relationship with God, what's our, in, what's our natural response? No way. I don't need him. I could do it all myself. I don't need a relationship with God. And yet, he pursued us. Because when he saw us, he wanted us. And he sought after us and pursued our hearts with his love. And that is an amazing thing. Because when you think about it, if we're honest, there's not a whole lot about us that's very lovable. And we're not bad people, but we're sinners. We're sinful human beings, and that's the opposite of God. And sometimes we forget how opposite of God that is. Let me give you an example. You ever stick something in the refrigerator in one of those Tupperware kind of containers that seals really good? And it's in the refrigerator for way too long? And you forget about it? And one day you see it back there in the back, and what is that? You pull it out and you pop that lid, and that smell hits you in the face. And what happens? There's an immediate gag reflex. You close that lid and you hold it at arm's distance to try to get it to where you need to throw it away. Do you realize that God is holy and we are sinful? And because He is holy, sin is putrid. Sin is the opposite of holiness. Sin is putrid and repulsive to God. What should He do with us? Because we are sinful. Hold us at arm's distance. And try not to gag while he takes us to where he can just dispose of us. What does he do? Not what should he do. What does he do? He loves us. He loves us in spite of all that we are. Why would God love us? When we say, no way, I don't want you. When we reject him, when we spurn his love, when we spurn his advances, why would God want us? Because love simply loves what it wants. His heart is filled with love for us. And love will endure a lot of things. Love will endure rejection. Love will endure heartache. Love will endure a lot of pain. Because true love never gives up loving the one it wants. When I, you may, some of you may have heard me share this in the past. Years ago, I was called early one morning and was asked by a, a couple if I would go see their son who was in jail. He had been arrested on a possession charge again. It wasn't the first time. 
And this couple had endured a whole lot from this young man. Multiple arrests. He had stolen from them. He had lied from them. He had blamed them. And yet they still loved him. It didn't matter what he did. He was their son. And he loved, and they loved him no matter what. See, that's what love does. Love says it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. I love you. Now keep that in mind and think about the text that Bobby read, the account of the Samaritan woman. Jesus travels to Samaria for the purpose of connecting with this woman. Now we don't often, we kind of miss that part in the text. He went to Samaria to see her. And when he gets to Samaria, he sits down at Jacob's well, sends his disciples into town to buy food, and he waits. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for this woman to come to the well in the middle of the day. Why the middle of the day when none of the other women are coming? Because she's an outcast. She is a woman who has been rejected by her community. No one wants a relationship with her. She is absolutely all alone in the world except for the man she's with. Does Jesus know about that? I mean, think about it. God is holy and God is righteous, but God is also all-knowing. He knows everything. He knows, Jesus, when he walked this earth, knew everything about every person he ever encountered. He knew everything about this woman before she ever showed up at the well. He knew she'd had five husbands and she's shacking up with a guy. But she also, he also knew every time she lied, cheated, stole, lusted, coveted, he knew everything about her. Everything. And yet he was waiting there for her. Why? Because love wants what love wants. And he was pursuing her heart. When she came to that well, he was waiting for her. He had gone there specifically to meet her. Now this was a woman who, as I said, was rejected by her society, by her community. She had no family. She had no friends. She's living with a guy because she has no choice. She's using her body to survive. Not unlike a prostitute on the street who does what she does because she's hungry and she has no other choice. Jesus is there to meet her. And when she comes, he offers to her something she doesn't even know she needs. Doesn't even know she wants. He offers her life. He offers her life. Water filling her up. Living water flowing out of her is what he calls it. He offers her life. She didn't even know she needed it. She thought she was okay. She thought she was doing okay by human standards. But Jesus offers her what she truly needs. And what's her first immediate response? No way. Why would I need you? She was argumentative. Once he began to address the real issues, he was argumentative. You know, you Jews do this and you do that. You know, she wanted to distract and cause friction. But it didn't matter. Jesus deals with her honestly and openly. Go call your husband. Bring him here and let's talk about it. I don't have a husband. You're right, Jesus said. You've had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. You Jews say this, you Jews say that. See, Jesus spoke honestly to her about her life, about her sin, not to condemn her. He wasn't condemning her. He just spoke the facts. But to reveal the extent of his love. See, it didn't matter what she'd done in the past. It didn't matter what she was doing right now, the sin she was involved in. It did not matter. What mattered is that he is God and he loved her and he wanted her, regardless. The young man that I went to the jail to see, I sat across the glass with a little telephone talking to him. And we got to the point in the conversation where he's blaming this and blaming that. And he says, you know, your choices, what you did got you here. You're here because you were doing drugs and dealing drugs. You know what he did? Began to beat the glass. He wanted to come through the glass 
after me. He wanted, I think at that moment, to kill me because we don't like our sin exposed. We don't like for who we truly are to be seen. We want to hide it like our dirty laundry, stuff it under the bed so nobody can see it. But you can't do that with God. You can't hide your sin. You can pretend like it doesn't matter, but He's God. He sees everything. And what Jesus wanted that woman to know is, I know you're a sinful human being, and you know what? I still love you. And I still want you. And what God is trying to convey to all of us is that He is a pursuing God, that He yearns to connect with sinful human beings, and we don't have to hide our sin anymore and pretend like it doesn't matter or, or, or make more of ourselves than we are. We can be honest with who we are because He already knows. He knows we're sinful. He knows we've fallen short. He knows the mistakes we've made. He knows what we're doing now. And he says, I still want you. I still want you because I still love you. And more than that, what does he do? He chooses to deal with our sin himself. I want to read a passage to you. And when you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our sins. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligation that was against us and opposed us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Do you understand what Paul is saying in that text? That we had an obligation. There was a debt we owed. A price that we needed to pay because of sin. An astronomical price that we could have never paid, but we owed the debt. And what did God do? He took that debt and nailed it to the cross. He took the debt we owed when he put his son upon the cross for us. Like telling little Evie here, how much does God love us? He says he loves us, for God so loved the whole world. You heard that passage? But saying it is one thing. Revealing it by your actions is another. How much does God love every person in this world? Paul also wrote, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we and him might become the righteousness of God. Jesus on the cross took sin. That which is putrid, that which would make you gag, that which you would hold at arm's distance and throw away, that which you turn away from in disgust, that is Jesus on the cross with my sin and your sin. Why would God love us that much? Why would God do that? Because love simply loves. And there's no limit to God's love for us. When that woman at the well understood that in spite of everything she had done in the past and in spite of her life and the situation she's in right now, that the Messiah himself still wanted her, it changed her life. She couldn't go and tell people of Jesus fast enough. Her life was immediately transformed because she experienced the fact that God loved her. Now, he didn't just say it. He was there in person revealing it. So let me ask you, what's holding you back? What's holding you back from experiencing the absolute joy of your salvation? We hear it. We say we believe in Jesus as our Savior. We confess that we acknowledge that he died for the sins of the world. We even, we even proclaim he's my Savior. We come to, to church and we worship him. And then we walk out these doors and we live as if it really doesn't make a difference. Have we really forgotten how far we have fallen and the depth of God's love to rescue us? I think we have. 
Most of you who are here, I think, know my story. I try not to use personal illustrations very much, but I am today. If you know anything about my past, you know that there was a long time in my life that I truly believed it was possible for someone to be so bad, so damaged, so sinful, that they simply became unwanted. They were unworthy of God loving them. That was me. I was going to hell, and I knew that. And I was okay with that because that's what I deserved. Let me tell you a not-so-secret secret. Hell is exactly what every one of you deserves. We're all sinners. And there's not a one of us, you, me, anyone, who deserves to be saved. It's not about what we deserve. It's not about what we merit or what is owed to us. It's purely about God's heart and the fact that in spite of all that we are, He loves us. When God came to you, when God came to you and said he loved you and said he wanted you, what was your first response? Ladies, how did you respond to the guys in your life the first time? No way. Wasn't our first response when God came? No way. I'm done. Is that God's attitude? No. Why are you with the man you're with? Because he pursued you. Because he wouldn't take no for an answer. Because he kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, breaking down the barriers until you understood the reality of his love. That's exactly what God has done. He comes over and over again, time and time again. He will not wash his hands of us. He will not reject us. He will not turn his back on us. He keeps coming over and over again, little by little, breaking down the barriers until finally, until finally, we understand how much he loves us. And we give in to that love. And you know what happens in that moment? God celebrates. And that's the most beautiful thing in the Bible that God celebrates. Do you know the passages? There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He doesn't say the angels are rejoicing. He said the angels are witnessing the rejoicing. Zephaniah tells us that God will rejoice over us with singing. Do you understand who Jesus is? Do you understand the heart of our God? He's the Father running down the road because he sees his prodigal coming home. He's the shepherd who puts the lamb on his shoulders and goes home rejoicing because he's found that which was lost. He's the bridegroom who grasps a hold of his bride and holds her tight and will never let her go. He's the parent who cuddles the small child and says, I love you no matter what because you're mine. Do you understand that God has pursued you over and over and over again because his heart was desperately in love with you? So I'm going to end this message by saying once again what you've heard me say so many times in the past, but this time I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it and I want you to think of the cross as God doesn't just say it to you, he shows you by his actions exactly what he means. God declares to you, I love you. I want you. And I will never, never let you go. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Well, good.